Uh, attention, salute, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. So, Ken, would you come up here? We put a lot of expectations on you. And he's going to tell us about the history. Thank you, Ray. Well, you know, when I look around the room here, I might be one of the teenagers in the group. Uh, <laughs> Miller back there, you know, he's in three digits now. It, it's, it's wonderful to see everybody here today. And, uh, I may have been overbilled slightly by Ray, but uh, uh, what you're going to get today is what I might define as, as Kingsport light, because Kingsport's got such a great history that uh, it, no, no 30 or 40 or 50 minutes can do it justice in any way, shape, or form. <clears throat> so what I am going to attempt to do here in the next uh, few minutes is to, we might describe this as a tree. I'm going to talk about the trunk of the tree. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the roots, I'm not going to talk about many of the branches, but uh, Kingsport could be uh, compared to a growing for a tree from a sprig or a seed up to what we have all around us here today. And I'm not going to deal with the ancient history. Uh, Jerry Fritz talked about that some last meeting we had and other people have. What I'd like to talk to you about is basically the history of Kingsport from 1890 to after World War II. Uh, in 1902, there's a good benchmark, in the valley right here where we are, right in the downtown area of Kingsport, there were 300 people, all farmers. Uh, Kingsport, the original Kingsport had disappeared and had not uh, been resuscitated as it was in the years after that. <clears throat> the, the biggest construction project that came to Kingsport in its early days was a railroad. Not the one we have now, a different railroad. It was called the, Carolina, the, the, the Charleston, Cincinnati, and Chicago Railway. And it was being sponsored by a gentleman named General uh, W.T. Wilder, who was a Union general in the War of Yankee Aggression. He came uh, through the battles in Chattanooga with Sherman, and then he came back to the South and became one of the leading iron and steel producers in the South in Chattanooga. He also developed Roan Mountain. But his, his passion was the three C's, the Charleston, Cincinnati, and Chicago Railway, to build from Charleston to Cincinnati, right across the mountains, right through the area we are. And that was incorporated in 1886. And in the four years from then until 1890, uh, the Three Seas Railroad built about 300 miles of railroad grade. I say grade, not track. They built about 100 miles in South Carolina, from Camden, South Carolina, up to the area around Marion, North Carolina. And then they graded the railroad from around Spruce Pine down the Nolichucky River across East Tennessee, right through here, just a few hundred yards away, uh, through Gate City, around through Copper Creek, and up the Clinch River Valley to St. Paul, Virginia. Now, the three C's went broke in 1890 as a result of the failure of a bank in England called Bearing Brothers. Now, there was another Bearing Brothers that went broke in Singapore about 30 years ago, but there no relationship between the two. The thing that killed the three C's financial relationship with Bearing Brothers is South Africa, of all things. It was an English bank, and in 1889, 1890, the gold mines and the diamond mines in South Africa came across very poor seams where the diamonds and the gold was mined, and as a result, they went into receivership and brought down Bearing Brothers in England and the three C's project here in East Tennessee. Uh, most of you probably know the area pretty well. 
So let me just describe a couple of things about the three C's that you probably don't realize, but that are really there. The drawdown of Boone Lake, because of the defect in the dam, has exposed about 20 miles of the 3C grade, which is in the lake up there. And it's, uh, it was basically on the level when the lake was full, the, the grade was right there. And there's several miles of stone walls along the banks of Boone Lake. Uh, Wing Deer Park in Johnson City, if anybody knows where that is, the 3C's grade went right through the middle of Wing Deer Park. It, it started in Carnegie, the eastern section of Johnson City. <clears throat> it, uh, there, there are miles of county road on the 3C's grade. Anybody here know where Cay Cliff is out near Boone Dam? I see two or three people. The 3C's grade goes right by the house at Cay Cliff, and the road you go up there to Cay Cliff on is the 3C's railroad grade. It, it came all the way out to the intersection of 23 and the airport parkway. Uh, it came on down this way. Uh, it, it came right across the Kingsport side of where uh, Patrick Henry Dam is now. The city water uh, pumping station on Holson River is built on the Three Seas grade. It came through the gap, John B. Dennis, it came right through the middle town here. Uh, and when you get down to Rotherwood, if you're going down the road to uh, Churchill on Rotherwood, when you cross the river, the North Fork, Big Elm Road turns right immediately. Go out Big Elm Road a mile, and you'll arrive on Three Seas Grade for two or three miles, and it's just really nice. It's flat, very narrow. Uh, occasionally, go down through a gip like that, come back up, which would, there would have been a bridge. Uh, when you're driving to Gate City, uh, and you're right beside the railroad track in Weber City, that's the actual grade. And the way you could tell it's the actual grade, I'm, I'm getting down one of the branches here, but we'll get back to the tree. The way you can tell it's a, one of the actual constructions of the three C's is there's two or three culverts, just, just pipes or just very small drainage uh, evidence alongside the road there. The ones that are cut stone were built by the three C's. Because after 1900, cut stone was pretty well uh, passe because concrete was so readily available and was, was used because it was cheaper. But that's one of the many ways you could tell. The road from Clinchport to Dungannon and Fort Blackmore, most of that is on the old Three Seas Grade. It's probably the longest piece of un incompleted railroad track in the United States. They went broke in 1890, and nothing happened in that direction for a number of years. So what I'm going to try to boil this down to is three or four general to topics. One. Let's talk about people. George L. Carter, John B. Dennis, Isaac T. Mann, Thomas Fortune uh, Ryan. Let's talk about Egyptians. I'll get back to that, really. Let's talk about organizations, the three C's that we just talked about. A company called Blair and Company, which most people have never heard of, but Blair and Company was the corporation that hosted the people that we know the names of who built the railroad and Kingsport. And let's talk a little bit about decisions. George L. Carter is the unsung father of not only Kingsport, but of East Tennessee and of Southwest Virginia. Carter was born in Hillsville, in Carroll County, Virginia, where Hillsville is, in 1857, and he didn't have a, a graduate degree. I think he went through like the sixth or seventh grade. <clears throat> but he was clerking in a general store in Hillsville that was run by J. Fred Johnson's family. And that's how J. Fred Johnson and Carter first knew each other. But in the 1880s, the Cripple Creek area of Virginia, which is the headwaters of the New River around Freeze and Galax, uh, became a real hot area for zinc and nickel mining. And Carter began speculating in land there. And he was very successful and made a good bit of money. Not only did he make a good bit of money, but he became to the attention of several of the leading people in Southwest Virginia as a pretty astute fellow 
is a good businessman, and so he wound up mm -hmm. uh, as a president of a company that had most of the iron furnaces in southwest Virginia. In, in the 1880s and 90s, iron was a local product. It wasn't centered in Cleveland or Pittsburgh or somewhere like that. So uh, he, through the iron business, discovered all this coal in southwest Virginia. So he began acquiring coal lands. Now, Carter had a lot of peculiar characteristics. The one that really stands out the most is he made Howard Hughes look like a gadfly. I mean, <laughs> Carter didn't leave anything. The only reason that anybody's ever been able to put together a history of Carter is from the court cases where he had to testify in, in, in all the legal ramifications involved with the coal business, the railroad business, the land business, uh, the whole sphere. To, to, to give you just uh, an example of the way he was, anybody here ever hear of J.C. Harkrater? Okay, J.C. Harkrater was the, the publisher and the owner of the Bristol Hill Courier. Carter, believe it or not, owned that newspaper back in the 19 to 1916 era. And Carter had many ups and downs financially, which we'll get into. But uh, in 1916, he was hard up in one of his many situations. So he called Charlie Harcrater up and said, Charlie, meet me at the Windsor Hotel Saturday night at 10 o'clock, and I'll sell you the Bristol Hero Courier. So Charlie got his money together and went down to Johnson City to the Windsor Hotel at 10 o'clock at night, and here's Carter, and it was in the wintertime, and they proceed to execute the sale. Harcrater conveys the money, Carter conveys the charter in the minutes book, and then they have what they call a burn book settlement. They proceed with the fireplace to burn every record of the Bristol Herald Courier that's Carter got anything to do with Carter. And that was called a burn book settlement. And there was a number of those cases. That's, that's just an easy example. There were there are bunches of them. And for that reason, there's nothing printed around for Carter except what people who weren't related to him in any way wrote down and these court cases. Anyway, by 1900, Carter had assembled over 300,000 acres of coal lands in southwest Virginia, which were essentially worthless because <coughs> there was no way to get the coal from there to somebody who would pay you to deliver it and burn it. So Carter realized that the way to make that coal valuable was to build a railroad from the coal lands to a market that needed coal. Now, in 1902, he began buying up the little fragments of the three seas that still existed. And he incorporated a company called the South and Western Railway. Now, that's pretty vague. And the charter was even vaguer. The South and Western Railroad was chartered with the purpose of building a railroad from any place on the Atlantic Ocean to any place on the Great Lakes. Not very precise yet. Might have gone through Memphis, who knows? Anyway, he began assembling these pieces, and the South and Western Railway, uh, to keep his cover, he had other people buy these railroads in their names uh, with his money, and there were 13 different South and Western Railway companies. There was a South and Western Railway Company of Virginia, there was a South and Western Railroad Company of Virginia, there was a South and Western of Tennessee, North Carolina, South Carolina, Kentucky. Nobody could figure out anything. In fact, over the years, Carter was involved in a lot of litigation, and it was said that uh, you couldn't find a lawyer to sue him because I don't work for him. <laughs> in any event, uh, he started the South and Western Railroad, and by 1904, he had built a number of miles of that, but he had run out of money. So, what do you do when you run out of money? Well, you, uh, you know, in East Tennessee, you might print some, but that wasn't what they did. Uh, he went to New York, and he knew some of the people that we're talking about, but uh, he, he wound up an interesting Blair and Company. 
Blair and Company was a private bank, not like J.P. Morgan or, or uh, Wells Fargo or any of these people like that. It was a private bank of wealthy individuals. And Blair and Company uh, had lots of money, lots of capital to invest, and a great deal of management expertise. So in 1904, he went up there and convinced these fellows to come down to East Tennessee and Southwest Virginia and look at this coal land property that he owned and to consider financing the railroad. There's a well-known picture, which most of you have seen because it's been published many times, of these guys all on horseback in a circle in front of the Crane's Nest Mine in Tom's Creek, Virginia. And if I had the picture, I could tell you who they all are, but, but Carter is the guy on the end looking very you know, unobtrusive. In the middle is Thomas Fortune Ryan, John B. Dennis, Isaac T. Mann, T. Jefferson Coolidge, and uh, Ray Dennis, who was uh, John B. Dennis's brother, and a number of other people. In any event, they toured the property, came back to Bristol, and Carter organized a banquet for them there. And in typical fashion, he didn't show up. He had one of his lawyers come and do <coughs> master ceremonies. But nevertheless, these people agreed to finance the railroad and the coal company. That was the great step forward in success. But at that point, in 1905, when that was executed, Carter had already had a big influence on Kingsport because in 1902, he bought 12,000 acres of land from what basically is the far end of Holston Ordinance at Church Hill to Chestnut Ridge. This property right here was part of that property, 12,000 acres. He organized it as Kingsport Farms Incorporated and operated as a, as a farm. And another characteristic of his was he didn't, didn't trust people he didn't know. So he hired dozens of people out of Carroll County, Virginia. One of those people was James W. Dobbins. The Dobbins of Dobbins Taylor, Dobbins Bennett. Uh, and he brought him down here to run Kingsport Farms. Now, I'm, I'm jumping ahead here in just a minute, but, but uh, as I said, in 1916, uh, Carter was having one of his periodic financial breakdowns, and so he decided he would sell Kingsport Farms. But because J.W. Dobbins was here running it, had been running it for about 12, 12 13 years, he gave Dobbins 496 acres of land, which is basically the fair acres uh, Eastern Watauga section of the, of the 12,000 acres, and then he sold the rest of it to the Blair and Company principals. Uh, he never had a contract with Dobbins. He, he often <coughs> had people running businesses for him that had no kind of contract at all. It was just it was, it was a handshake deal, and most of the time it really worked. There were two or three cases that didn't work. Those are where the court <coughs> cases are that have brought us a lot of history of how, how he operated, what he did, and who won and who lost, and so forth. Anyway, between 1905 and 1915, the South and Western, as it was originally called, uh, was constructed from Elkhorn City, Kentucky, at the head of Levisa Fork, which is a tributary to the Ohio River, to Spartanburg, South Carolina straight across the mountains. Now, I say straight across the mountains, I don't know if you can see this, but on the back of the shirt, it's got a map of the Clinchfield. It's, it's straight in the sense that from one end to the other, it's straight, but it, it crosses that line a number of times, as you, can, as you can see here. But that's 277 miles of mountain railroad, and it turned out to be the most expensive railroad ever built in the United States on a mile for mile basis, because it didn't go around the mountains, it went through them. That's the hit. Four, four percent of the railroad was underground. Fifty-five tunnels in that distance across there. My percentage was underground? Four percent. Four percent. Right. Wow. Uh, John B. Dennis was taken over the railroad after it was finished. He got to Spartanburg on a special train and somebody said to him, he said, well, Mr. Dennis, what do you think about this railroad that you've helped us finance and build? And he says, I think it's going to be great as soon as you finish covering it over. 
<laughs> in, any, in any event, the construction of the railroad suddenly made this coal property in southwest Virginia and eastern Kentucky and southern West Virginia very, very valuable. And between the time Carter sold his interest in the coal company, which became Hunchfield Coal Company, to the Blair Company interests, they acquired 650,000 more acres. So basically, Blair and Company eventually essentially owned the mineral rights in Wise County, in Dickens County, and in two or three of the counties of western eastern Kentucky. This was no this was no nickel and dime operation, as you can see. Uh, in 1908, after the construction was well advanced, they scrapped the South and Western name to a very specific name, the Carolina Clinchfield and Ohio Railway. Well, they made it to both Carolinas. The Clinchfield is the coal fields in southwest Virginia, which it traversed. They didn't make it to Ohio, but two out of three isn't bad. <laughs> in 19, let me get this right, yeah, 1916, now another one of Carter's uh, characteristics, he, he, he had unumptuous numbers of characteristics. Another characteristic was he didn't want to be involved in anything that he didn't control. Uh, so, as soon as the roads finished, he sold out in East Tennessee and moved to Coldwood, West Virginia. And that was in 1916. This, this is after he had financed and, and, and sponsored East Tennessee State in Johnson City. He owned the model mills in Johnson City, the flour mill that was there for many years. Uh, he sold Kingsport Farms in 1916. And he and J. Fred Johnson, his son-in-law, brother-in-law, had a big falling out in 1916. And there's been a lot of the speculation about what caused that. But the two stories uh, that I probably put most credible credits in is, is it, that uh, J. Fred Johnson and it was, was helping hide his sister from him because his sister was in love with somebody else and, and Carter found out about it. That's one story that they fell out over. The other story and this may not might be the reason, but this is another thing that happened with Carter. Is Carter owned banks in a number of places in southwest Virginia and East Tennessee. And back in the early part of this last century, check kiting was a pretty popular and totally legal prospect. And so Carter frequently wrote checks on your bank and used the money before it cleared your bank. And there's just lots of this. And, and Johnson was the president of one of the banks in Johnson City. <coughs> Carter owned. And Johnson's working for Carter, but he would not accept a kind of check. So they fell out over that. Anyway, in 1916, Carter left the area, and John B. Dennis became the man with Blair Company who operated and controlled the organization of the railroad and the coal company. And he hired J. Fred Johnson as his man in Kingsport. And that's how Jeffrey Johnson got started. Bear in mind, the city was incorporated in 1917, so a whole lot of things were going on in that 1914, <coughs> 15, 16, 17 era. Kingsport and the railroad and Clinchfield Coal Company are a perfect example of what you can do if you've got people with money, with vision, and the ability to organize. And that's that's the basic structure that Kingsport sprang up from. We also should be very thankful <coughs> in Kingsport for who? The Germans. The Germans have goosed Kingsport's economy over and over and over. We'll talk about that. Between 1910 and 1916, the railroad, with this 
property they bought from Carter and other property they owned already here <coughs> began developing Kingsport as an industrial center as a market for coal and for timber. Those were the two natural resources in the area. Timber's still here, the coal's pretty well gone. In 1910, Blair and Company financed Clinchfield Portland Cement Company, which was the first industry in Kingsport. Later became Penn Dixie. Uh, right after that, they attracted Brickmaker that became Kingsport Brick Company that eventually merged with Johnson City Brick Company and eventually became one of the biggest brick companies in the United States, General Shale. That was in 1911. Uh, they attracted Grant Leather Company. Bear in mind, 1911, rubber was not the big deal, it was leather with you know horses and saddles and harnesses and so forth. Uh, they also financed Kingsport Pulp Company to use some of these trees in the area. And they were involved in a number of sawmills because this was a virgin forest except right in the river valley in the early days of the last century. Blair and Company was looking for markets for the coal, markets for timber, and to show you how astute they were about timber, they put a man named W.M. Ritter on the uh, board of directors. Anybody ever heard of W.M. Ritter? One, one person. Well, W. Ritter was the, was the leading hardwood lumber producer in the United States. Uh, and guess what? He got the contract to harvest timber on almost a million acres in southwest Virginia and eastern Kentucky. Isn't it amazing how these things just coincidentally happen like this? <laughs> uh, incidentally, the company Georgia Pacific is the outgrowth of W. Ritter Company. That's a name that probably you, you would know now. Okay, so that's what's happened in the first five years of the 1910 decade. What happened in 1914? Anybody know? See, I did give you a leading, leading hit here, but that's when the Great War started, World War I. So, the American economic enterprise was very dependent on the Germans in a number of areas one of which was aniline dyes for, for fabric. The Germans were the technology leaders in dyes, uh, and suddenly you couldn't get dyes from Germany. So J. Fred Johnson and Dennis and Blair and Company organized a company called Federal Dye and Chemicals to come to Kingsport and build a dye plant. Uh, some, of the, some of the pieces that lasted until maybe 20 years ago, but, uh, but it was a very short-lived visit. They also bought, bought in uh, American Wood Reduction Company, which has ties to what became Eastman, and a little known fact, they brought in Edgewood Arsenal, a government enterprise. How many of you remember Wilcox Drive before Eastman was on each side? It was a great big round brick concrete building over in what's now the parking lot between the Eastman Employee Center and the other uh, buildings. Anybody remember that building? Sam, Sam Anderson later had a scrapyard there in that same building. Anyway, that was the powder magazine for Edgewood Arsenal. And their job was to fill shells with chlorine, poison gas, for World War One. Anyway, <coughs> President Wilson kept us out of war for three years and then he jumped in in 1917 and four million people were uh, conscripted into the army and sent to Europe and, and well, worked in France until the end of the war on November 11, 1918. Well, on the, no, no, apparently on November 19th, the three industries that had come here as a result of the war, the dye works, the wood reduction plant and the powder magazine all shut out. No reason for them, but keep going. They can still get dyes in Europe now. Uh, wood reduction, with the, uh, wood alcohol in Germany as well. So that's all that problem. So J. Fred Johnson and Dennis are now faced with, now what do we do? So they go out and they again begin recruiting new industries. And the industries they recruited 
Um, let me find the list here and just be sure I've got it right. The, the first one they got was Blue Ridge Glass. How many of the ladies here remember Pyrex? Mm. Yeah. Okay, some, some do. Pyrex was, I guess, the original glass cooking item. And Blue Ridge Glass originally was, constrict, was constructed to build to, to market Pyrex. Um, they brought in the Kingsport Press. The, the Kingsport Press building, which is right across the street here, uh, was built in 1920. The, the steel framework was built in 20, 1920 uh, for uh, military purposes, mainly uh, stuff to be used with animals and, and beasts of burden. But when the war was over, of course, that went down the tubes too. And, and between 1920 and 25, Blair and Company financed and organized the Kingsport Press Company. Anybody remember who the leading name in Kingsport in that era was briefly? Rail Cox. George George L. Bush's George George Bush's father lived in White City, which was mentioned a few minutes ago, mm -hmm. and was here to help organize the Kingsport Press. They also attracted Ford Mills, a textile company in Massachusetts. Gordon Mills built the biggest king, building in Kingsport up until uh, they tore it down. And they attracted Holliston Mills. These are the people that they <coughs> replaced the earlier industries with, and all basically in this same strip of land right through town. And they attracted George Eastman. We'll come back to him in a minute. I, took, I said earlier that Blair and Company was a well-financed, well-instructed <coughs> organization. Just to show you an indication of the financing, uh, I subscribed to Forbes magazine and they had an article sometime in the last year about the wealthiest people, they do it every year, the wealthiest people in the world now. But they started in 1916, I believe, with the first edition of the wealthiest people in the United States. And this, this gentleman, Thomas Fortune Ryan, was number 14 out of the 500 wealthiest people in the United States. Uh, Isaac T. Mann, another one of these people, was not on that list, but he was one of the leading coal developers in West Virginia. And as you know, West Virginia, uh, apparently you can just walk off with coal in your pocket up there and so much of it. So these people with Blair Company were no uh, financial slouches and they were very astute people. T Thomas Fortune Ryan was a Virginian, as a matter of fact, but he, one of his biggest uh, holdings was Consolidated Edison, the power company for Chicago. In any event, that's kind of where we come to the aftermath of World War II. And then, Jazam, lightning struck. In 1923, Blair and Company decided they would just dissolve the company. They didn't sell it to somebody. They didn't merge it with anybody. They just decided, we've had it. We went our separate ways. James A. Blair, who was the leader of Blair and Company, sold his interests, went to the Caribbean, bought an island, and lived a happy life down there in the, in the <laughs> warm territory of the Caribbean. And all the other people went their separate ways. John B. Dennis, came to Kingsport to manage the Kingsport assets, the coal assets, and their interest in the railroad. <coughs> the railroad turned out to be a big, big problem because when they decided they would sell the railroad and started the process through the legal and regulatory processes, the federal government says, you can't sell the railroad. The reason you can't sell the railroad is because it is such a strategic place that if you sell it to anybody that you connect with, you'll do irreparable, irreparable damage to the other rail, railroads that operate in that area. So you cannot sell it. So they did the next best thing. They leased it. They leased it to the Atlantic Coastline Railroad, which ran from Richmond to the Tampa area, and to the Louisville National Railroad, it ran from Louisville and Cincinnati to Atlanta uh, and New Orleans. Uh, they leased the CCNO Railroad <coughs> to those people for, for not nine years, 
or 99 years, they leased it for 999 years. <laughs> at 5% of the capital stock face value, which was $50 million at the time, and 5% 5 dividend payable annually in gold, 1925. Be careful what your government does to you because these people that carried off the stock in the CCO Railroad with this 5% gold principle, guess what happened in 1932? Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Roosevelt took us off the gold standard. So suddenly this gold became paper. But in 1929, with the stock market crash, the Great Depression started, and believe it or not, interest rates were down lower than they are today. One percent, half a percent, three quarters of a percent, and here are these guys sitting on these CCNO stock certificates, getting five percent, getting ten times what other people could get in some cases. One of the interesting things about the Depression, which many of you may not know, is that uh, 1932 was the actual depth of the Depression, and that's what I always thought. And I thought we just gradually climbed out of it after that. It turns out 1938 was a very close competitor to 1932, and that was because the federal government changed some of their policies and basically forced us back into another Depression rather than, than uh, continuing to climb out of the hole. <clears throat> Uh, so that's the story of what happened to the CCNO Railroad. Now, in 1925, the owners, the, the lessors, lessors, yes, lessees, lessees, uh, formed a business called the Clinchfield Railroad Company. Right here, that wasn't a corporation. That was just them. It was their. They, were, they had the lease and they just operated as a Clinchfield Railroad Company. No corporation. If you sued them, you were actually suing the Atlantic Coast Line, LN Railroad, and so forth. And they paid that 5% all through the Depression. And it was some of the best money they ever spent because the, the Clinchfield Railroad, after World War II, became one of the most profitable railroad projects in the United States because coal boomed. The southeast United States became dependent on coal-fired uh, electric uh, generating plants. And at one time, we had 30 trains a day going through Kingsport, of which about 24 were coal trains or 10 to 12,000 tons apiece, fueling Duke Power, South Carolina, Get It, Madison Electric, uh, Savannah Electric, you know, this other company, uh, people in Florida. It, it was a it was a fabulously successful business uh, eventually, but you, sometimes all good things have to wait. So that's, in a nutshell, what happened with the development of Kingsport before uh, 1950. Except, and I'm, and I'm going to come back to Eastman for a moment, the only other industry that has ever come to Kingsport after Blair and Company dissolved, was Holston Ordnance. And Holston Ordnance is now our second largest employer in industry. It's got about 1,100 employees. They're running at, at uh, maximum output, very successful uh, manufacturing situation, critical issue with the government and the military, and it's the largest conventional explosive company in the world, right there across the river. <laughs> All right, <clears throat> Charlie had held up his hand. He's going to pull the pulley on me when 11 o'clock comes, so I'm, but I'm getting through, Charlie. You're in good shape. Okay. Uh, in 1920, John B. Dennis and J. Fred Johnson and others marketed the American wood reduction property to George Eastman because he was looking for a place he could build a manufacturing facility to provide his raw materials, because he said he would never again be dependent on raw materials from outside the United States. So in 1920, he bought the corpus of the American Wood Reduction Company and formed Tennessee Eastman Corporation, that name has changed a number of times, uh, to build 
a wood distillation plant. And so they built a very large sawmill, basically on the site where the research development easement is on, on Lincoln Street. And they brought in logs from all over North Carolina, Virginia, East Tennessee, to the sawmill. And in addition, they also bought 40,000 acres of timberland, uh, much of which was in the Blairs Gap area, down at the far end of Holston Mountain, basically about six miles south of Sigourneysville, and built a 27-mile railroad from the plant here in Kingsport, right down the side of Bays Mountain, to Blairs Gap, which operated from 1927 to 1940, uh, to bring in additional wood. And they, uh, the, the critical material that he was interested in initially was wood alcohol. Uh, but as they operated, they developed a system where they was kind of like, you heard about eat the whole hog. Well, they, they ate the whole tree. They, the, the slabs from the sawmill went into the retorts and were cooked, uh, distilled into uh, uh, rough chemicals. The, Sawdust was used uh, for the boilers. The little scraps of things were used for the boilers. One of the, one of the other strange things, which is probably not very well known, is that uh, Eastman, right here in Kingsport, developed the charquette. They had all this sawdust, and so they invented or developed or constructed a machine to compress sawdust into briquettes, and then they would put them in the uh, retorts and fire them, which what you do what you do in charcoal. And anybody here ever know J.K. Gillenwater? Anybody remember him? There's one. J.K. Gillenwater was a native of Stonega, Virginia, which is above Appalachia. He eventually was the <coughs> was the uh, director of purchasing for Eastman. And he told me this story one time. He uh, he was a sort of, he was a, a charcoal salesman. That's what he did at Eastman in the late twenties. And, but he was, before that, he'd been in the plant in some place, and he said, you know, he says, I want to give you a, a, a story about you can get a good idea anywhere. He said, we built this charcoal, charquette machine down there right next to the sawmill, and we fired it up, and we ran the first batch of charcoal, and we opened the door, and we showed it out, all out on this platform, this country platform. And we had one three-ton lump. Those things had stuck together like uh, crazy, and we could not get them apart. So we could hit it with a hammer and, and break it up, and then you got dust, and you got fives, and you got sharp pieces. And so we had everybody who made more than 10 cents an hour trying to figure out what to do about that. And said so we had a guy who drove a, a truck back and forth to the post office and then delivered the mail around the plant. And I said, I was down there one day, and this guy was there, and he said, Jake, you got any idea of what we could do about this sawdust problem here, about this charcoal problem? I can't, can't get the char kids to come out by themselves. And he said, oh yeah, Mr. Jake, he says, that's easy. He said, how is it easy? He said, you're gonna do it. He says, you get those green char kits, you lay them out there on that concrete, and you get you a hose with a spray, and you just spray them, get them wet, damp. And then you take a shovel and just throw sawdust on them. So that sawdust will stick to that water. And when you put them in that retort, they won't stick together. And they didn't. <laughs> so, you know, it didn't, didn't take a PhD to work solve that problem. <laughs> Anybody here ever heard of pyroligneous acid? That, that, that fits because we're going back to Egypt, Bob, and you know you were there, weren't you? Pyroligneous acid uh, has been known since biblical days, and apparently uh, the cedars of Lebanon were the source of pyroligneous acid in, in ancient times, and that was used as the embalming fluid for the pharaohs. But the first thing that you got out of the wood retorts out here was pyroligneous acid. Then the Eastman distilled it into the various constituents that were in it, uh, which is, you know, it's amazing how 
interconnected the world is, but how interconnected the world was 3,000 years ago in certain ways. That, that pyrolingus acid uh, was distilled into acetic acid, which is most of us would know it's vinegar if we cook, acetone, wood alcohol, methanol, and wood tar, which uh, most of us would call creosote, and a number of other chemicals. Acetic anhydride came along later in the Eastman concept here, but the acetic acid was also a critical component in photography, in black and white developing of photography. So that was uh, methanol, wood alcohol, and, acid, and acetic acid were the, were the keys there. Going back to charcoal for just one other little comment is, guess what the leading use of charcoal was in the 20s? Yes, sir? Cooking on the railroad. Exactly. Before, before the railroads got compressed gas and electricity on the dining cars and the passenger service, they cooked with charcoal. And that's what uh, was the original uh, uh, market for charcoal writ large. And the other one was in refrigerated cars handling foodstuffs. Even in the 20s, the Central Valley of California was a big producer of fresh vegetables. And in the winter, they had to haul it over the Sierra Nevadas into the Midwest, and they froze. And so they would put charcoal heaters in the ice bunkers on the refrigerated cars in the wintertime to keep them from freezing coming over the mountains in the Midwest. And in the summertime, they put ice in those bunkers to keep them from getting hot. So those were the two big uh, markets for charcoal in the 20s and the early 30s that Eastman had a big hand in. They also made a product, product uh, called No Decay, which was their version of creosote. I'm sure the EPA would blanch if you brought one of their samples into the building down. In, in about 1930, Eastman, Tennessee Eastman Corporation developed cellulose acetate. Cellulose acetate was the first major plastic and cellulose acetate was made out of wood pulp. Again, Eastman Kodak was the big customer because they were previously were using nitrate as film, which was highly flammable. Cellulose acetate solved the flammability problem, and as Eastman started making in 1930, uh, cellulose acetate and its derivatives kept Kingsport out of the Great Depression because Eastman hired people, a number of people, all through the Depression because the cellulose acetate process just grew and grew and grew and grew. Uh, eventually, it became one of the products was, was chrome spun, which was a fiber that was used in things like hotel draperies where the flammability was an issue. Uh, and, and, you know, what goes around comes around. Uh, the other product that became a big issue with sales acetate was cigarette filters. And all of us know what's happened to cigarettes and cigarette filters. And now Eastman has got a major research and development program going on to develop a new family of fibers with cellulose acetate. Same, same product, different market. Uh, you know, it, 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 not, nothing ever actually goes completely away. It may get, get kind of distant or faded or unknown, but it, it, almost everything comes around eventually again. <clears throat> Another question. How many people here are natives of Kingsport? This is the Mississippi. Yeah. Okay, so only about maybe a third of us. You know, I, I'm a native of Kingsport, but I've lived here over and over again. And I was never an Eastman person as a child, so I was discriminated against. Anyone who didn't work at Eastman or was not a family of an Eastman person was discriminated against. I, 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 I know discrimination firsthand. You you couldn't find anybody to play with on Saturday morning. On you, you couldn't find anybody on Sunday afternoon because they all went to the yeah. movie and to lunch and to the cafeteria. So so I've been discriminated against. But. But one thing got over the whole community, Eastman and Eastman Knots. Does anybody here remember a little disc, or I say disc, a little rectangular thing, it was about that 
wide. It was, it was rectangular. It was about that size right there. Everybody had one. You know what that was? Gail, do you know? No. <clears throat> As I say, <clears throat> cellulose acetate was the first major product for, uh, in plastics. And, and people made screwdriver handles out of them, they made toothbrush handles, made knobs for your steering wheel in your car with cellulose acetate, those things like that. But the product was called Tinite. And everybody in Kingsport, it, it, well, let me go back. In, in, in the color lab at Eastman, where they, where they made tinite to fit the color of your toothbrush or the steering wheel and so forth, they had these chips. That's what I, what I call it. about that size. They were about a little half an inch thick, and, and they had a little step on them. And, and they had hundreds and hundreds and maybe thousands and thousands of these chips, and they were on a big chain. And you go in there and you say, okay, I want to match this tooth. Okay, Alan, you you take the one that had the right kind of colors on it, and you go down there until you found one that was the same color. But somehow or another, there was a big leak because everybody in Kingsport had one of those things to scrape ice off their windshield. <laughs> and they were soft enough it wouldn't scratch your glass, and they were hard enough that you could not break them. And, I mean, it was it was like having running water. That was, that was a critical issue. So... Eastman security was not that good. <laughs> Five minutes, Caleb. Okay. <laughs> okay. Five minutes. This will be this will be the quickest run through in history on five minutes. Okay. <laughs> what happened in 1939 that's related to what I've already talked about? World War II. September 1st, 1939, those Germans, those pesky Germans, invaded Poland and World War II started. Okay? Like I say, 1938 was the low, second low point in the American economy. In 1939, it started doing this, and it did this all the way past the Korean War. But back to the Germans. Uh, Roosevelt kept us out of the war until the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. But by then, the military development in the U.S. had been, it was huge. My father had been in the Army two years by that time. Uh, and so on December the 9th, the United States declared war on Japan, but we also declared war on Germany. They didn't declare it on us, we declared it on them. But I don't think that makes a great deal of difference because it was clear that we had to deal with both of them. But it's kind of an interesting thing that they declared war on us after we on them. And immediately, the impact of the Germans, these pesky Germans again, became huge. In the six months from January 1st, 1942, this is three weeks after the war started, to the end of June, the German submarines sank 436 American ships along our east coast and in the Gulf of Mexico. That was twice the number of ships that we could build at that point. And we were in desperate shape. Well, the, the Germans, between World War I and World War II, developed a submarine as a very effective vehicle, particularly in the manufacture and assembly of real high performance steel. So the British are out there trying to sink the U-boats who are quarantining the British Isles in 1939 and 40 and 41, and the depth charges that they're dropping on these submarines won't penetrate the hulls. They're using TNT. So they come to the United States to the War Department with a product that they call RDX, which is Research Development Explosive. And they say to the War Department, we need somebody who can make this product in large quantities quick because we're not able to sink these submarines and they're straining us. So one of the critical elements of the RDX process was the use of acetic anhydride, which Eastman knew a great deal about, 
And acetic acid uh, is in the same family. Acetic acid is in high value water and other things. So the uh, water department comes to Eastman and says, we've got this sample, and I think it was like it had 12 gallons of this material. It says, we've got this, this dilute acetic acid stream. Can you clean it up? Well, they didn't tell these when it was contaminated with high explosives. They just told them this acetic acid would need a little cleaning up. Anyway, Lee Davey and, and several other of the people at Eastman, Bob Miller probably knew most, most of the people involved there, uh, developed a process for making RDX in a continuous form. Uh, last month, uh, Jerry Fritz talked about the Wexler Bend project. That's where they, that's where they mastered the technology of making RDX. So as soon as, as soon as Eastman came back to the government and says, we can make it, and this is the way we do it, and here are the processes, the government says, we'll make it. We'll finance it, you make it. And that's the origin of Holston Ordnance Works. In 1942, Eastman uh, designed and, and oversaw the construction of, of RDX at Area B and Area A. Um, and before they finished the first plant, the first, the, the plant, the government came back and said, we like for you to double it. So in 1944, they finished the plant. It took 15,000 construction people in Kingsport in 1942 and 43 to build that plant. People, people slept in tents, they double bunked, uh, one slept in the daytime, one slept at night. It was a chaotic time. Anyway, that's how RDX got into the scheme of things in Eastman. Now, as I said earlier, it's the largest explosive plant in the world that's not nuclear. Um, and <clears throat> to, to show you, to, just, just to illustrate what RDX's capability is, it's 70% more potent explosive-wise than TNT. And to make it safer to handle, they mix TNT with it to, to tone it down. Maybe they didn't want to blow the submarines up on the shore. But, uh, <laughs> anyway, that, that's an illustration of the situation there. Uh, rather than get out on the branches, I'll try to wrap this up here before Charlie pulls the plug on the microphone here. Here we are in 2019. The Clinchfield Railroad came along here 110 years ago uh, in 1909. And the people who built the Clinchfield Railroad and, and developed the coal fields in Southwest Virginia organized the community here. They organized the city government. They planned the city. By the way, George O. Carter planned the downtown Kingsport in 1905. It's not the guy who gets credit for it in 1917. It was George O. Carter in 1905. And that was a great surprise to me. But I was in the conference room of Wilson Worley Gamble downtown here 30 years ago. And they had a blueprint on the wall. And here's a blueprint of Broad Street and the Church Circle and Wanola and uh, I forgot what the other two are, Charlemont, there's three of them. And down the bottom uh, it says uh, uh, D.R. Beeson, who was a surveyor in Johnson City, and it's dated uh, some month in 1905. And then later I read in D.R. Beeson's diaries, D.R. Beeson has not been dead very long, uh, I read in his diaries his story of surveying Broad Street and the Circle Streets when it was just nothing but, he said, a great big thicket. He talked about ruining a pair of serge pants, walking through the thicket with his transit and so forth. So anyway, we, we, we've come a long way. We've come a long way. But you know, some things are still the same. Uh, <clears throat> Eastman made chemicals out of pyroligneous acid. After World War II, Eastman went to Texas and built Texas Eastman Company to make the same raw materials for here at Kingsport that were being made by the uh, distillation of wood. And then in 1982, Eastman built the coal gasification plant on Long Island using coal to make the same chemicals. It's, it's, a, it's a technological world and an evolutionary world. So here we are using the same raw materials to make a lot of the same things we start off with wood, then we went to natural gas, now we got coal. <coughs> Who knows? 
it might be solar next week. So George, East, George Carter, George o. Carter, uh, is, is still an influence on Kingsport even to this day just because of the foundation that he and the people he attracted here put together to make us successful. In the railroad, the Clinchfield Railroad, every day still brings in a wood pulp that comes from South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. Uh, we get parasilene. Uh, it's amazing. I was uh, working on the railroad in Pascagoula, Mississippi, and they were talking about building an oil refinery there, and now Eastman gets something like uh, 10 or 12,000 tons a week of parasilene from that oil refinery. And I remember the place when it was nothing but a swamp. So, you know, I'm beginning to be a little history myself. Uh, we get the various alcohols from Eastman and other people. And all those raw materials um, are continuing to make us successful in our production at Eastman, at Domtar, wood. That's, that's the natural resource we still got. Domtar gets wood from about a 150 mile radius of Kingsport. Um, the uh, folks at BAE at Holston uh, are getting acetic acid, acetic and hydride, uh, and, and cleaning it up, pushing it back, using it again, cleaning it. It's, it's being pumped back and forth between area A and area B for a very short time now along the pipeline of the railroad that goes across uh, Long Island to Sluice and so forth. You can see the pipes on the bridge. But they're in the process of building a plant at area B in Hawkins County to produce <coughs> anhydride uh, from the diluted acetic acid. So, thank goodness for the Germans. They got us going in World War I, they got us going in World War II. I hesitate to say we need them again, but you never know. But they are the unsung industrial sponsors of Kingsport, inadvertently, but in fact. So, that's the story, and that's how we got here on the tree trunk example of the tree. And there's all of you folks out here could go down, go up that tree and go out this branch and that branch and the other branch and tell us other stories that relate to these sorts of things. So I encourage you to think about that and do that because it's, it's somebody told me one time, says every, every time somebody passes away, it's like a library burns down. And, and, and that's true, that's true. So I appreciate your attention. I, uh, Charlie didn't pull the pull plug. I don't know if he got sleep or what. Anyway, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. And I'm always interested in things that happen here and that you know about and that I'd like to know about. And if you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer them now or as Alex says, uh, wherever, whenever the time permits. We've got a couple other things to do, so uh, Kent will stay around and answer all the questions you may have.